Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the invitation. It's my first time in Israel, so I'm enjoying this very much, and it's exciting to be here at the birth of this uh, new center. Uh, centers are good things. Everybody has said that, and I and I fully agree. It's a synergy and uh, the cross fertilization, cross pollination, whatever. Uh, pick your favorite uh, metaphor, but it's it's uh, it's uh, my best wishes of success. Um, so we 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 are doing uh, we have a little quantum optics shop at the University of Virginia, and we're doing something that is completely under the radar, and and that I uh, want to apologize to Klaus for my uh, obnoxious remark um, <laughs> or, or, or slash uh, uh, really ag aggressive advertising. Um, and and we're, we're, we're working with um, uh, systems that are not qubits. We call them Q-modes. And um, they can be entangled in... I can, I can sit there. It's fine. They can be entangled in really large numbers. And in fact, it's, it's sort of something that naturally has a tendency to scale big. So it's a system that uh, can, can be made uh, large scale in terms of quantum entanglement in many systems. So um, this uh, long chain that you see there that goes across the screen from left to right is something we made in the lab. Uh, that there's 60 modes in there, all entangled. This is a cluster state. Um, we think there's actually 3,000 of them in there. We could only measure 60, so that's what we're sure of. That thing uh, in the lower left corner is a square grid lattice, and that's something we haven't made yet, but we're considering. Um, and so our sponsors are on the other side. Um, and so, um, so we, do, we do this thing that I'm going to talk about, which is the first bullet. Second bullet is also uh, some things that we've done in my lab uh, in terms of quantum optics and quantum measurements. And uh, this is this uh, green uh, trace that you see at the bottom is a heterodyne polarimetry signal. So it's a, it's a little bit note at one megahertz between two polarizations. And it detects the polarization rotation as tiny. And the, the important thing is that the, the noise of a green trace is actually uh, lower than the shot noise, which is a blue trace, by 4.8 dB in, a, in an experiment. So we, we're still interested in doing experiments like that, trying to see how low we can go uh, in precision measurements and connecting both of them. Um, so I want to go with quantum computing for, for a little bit, because we're, I'm ta I talked about cluster states. And uh, there's essentially there's mo many ways to do quantum computing. Uh, some of which have been uh, mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, maybe it's off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the jet lag doesn't make me any faster. Sorry. <laughs> so, so. Um, um, the, the two main flavors of quantum computing that are engineered to deliver an exponential speed up, so so-called universal quantum computing, uh, the first one is well known, it's the, better, the best known, it's a circuit model, so you start with um, qubits, some of them have quantum informations, others are ancillas, they're in the product state, and then you have a quantum circuit, which is can be made uh, of single uh, and two qubit gates, and that's enough to make a universal gate set if you have an entangling gate like the C naught here. And here you have some measurements and uh, feed forward classical information from the measurements to some more unitaries. And for example, here you have a quantum teleportation gate uh, where the psi goes from qubit one to three. And so you start in separable states and you have quantum gates uh, that you that you end measurements. Uh, the other way to do that, which is interesting, is called one-way quantum computing, which is a particular case of measurement-based quantum computing. And the idea is that you start with what we could call a quantum computing substrate, and it's you still have to have good qubits, a lot of them, uh, but they are not in a product state. They are all pre-entangled in something called the cluster state. So uh, the cluster state for qubits. 
um, consists in taking all the qubits in a 0 plus 1, I forgot the square root of 2 is there, um, state, so 0 and 1 being the computational basis. And then you place, connect them with control Z gates. So you define some sort of graph like that. And if you take two of them and a control Z gate between them, if I take this state um, and I expand it, then I should have a plus here. But what the control Z gate is going to do is actually flip that sign from plus to minus. And it's the only, the only sign that's going to get flipped by the control Z gate because it only turns on if the control bit is 1. And if the target bit is 1, it's going to do a Z to it. So it's going to turn it into minus 1. If it's 0, it doesn't do anything. So then if you try to refactorize that state, once you flip the sign, you can't make it a product state anymore. It's a bell state for all intents and purposes. It's as good as a bell state. It's entangled. And um, you can actually uh, now take a lot of qubits, put them in some sort of square lattice, and apply these control Z gates. They commute with every, uh, each other. And eventually, you get a big, um, a big um, what's called cluster state. And the way you uh, do quantum processing is by doing a single qubit measurement. And then what's that going to do is it will not destroy the entangled state. It will just disentangle the qubit you just measured. But the rest of the state will stay together, but will change. Will change according to what you measured, what observable you measured, and what your measurement result was. And for example, um, with simple examples here, um, and this graph notation is really neat because it, 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 it shows you how it works. So the simplest example is that you can measure uh, Pauli operator Z or, well, Q for Q modes, and we'll talk about that later, uh, in the center uh, here, and that's going to just disentangle. You have to feed forward the measurement results to the neighbors. And in a sense, it works exactly like teleportation. It's a generalized teleportation operation. In teleportation, you have two entangled qubits, and Alice makes a Bell state measurement with a third qubit that has the information, and then sends to Bob the measurement results, and that's when Bob can, can know what, what he got. Well, for measurement-based quantum computing, it works exactly the same way. If you don't uh, do a um, feed forward, it's not going to work. So in that case, you measure Z. Um, so it could be the spin along Z, uh, Pauli operator Z. Um, on that center qubit, you get these two uh, split. But if you take the same initial graph and you measure x, so spin along x if you want, uh, then after the proper feedback, you're going to get a feed forward, sorry, to the uh, neighbors. You're going to get this. So the graph will change, and you will actually bridge the two neighbors to, to have direct entanglement together. Uh, and you can go crazy if you have uh, that kind of junction here. And you measure the center. You measure x on the center. You do fit forward, and then you get that. You get some sort of local complementation of a graph. And this is really neat because cluster states can be manipulated and shaped and just by measurements. So all you do is measurements, single qubit measurements. You change the graph, you change the, the way the qubits are entangled, and you can show that you can also uh, make a quantum computing algorithm um, process like that. Now, what we want is that kind of guy here. Right? We want a cluster state that has a ton of qubits. That's, that's what we, so what we do, do in my lab is that we, you know, there's the two challenges, the scalability and the fight against decoherence. And of course, we've talked about trapped ions and superconducting qubits have amazing uh, performance and fidelity with uh, reaching the uh, fault tolerance threshold of 10 minus 4 error rate. So that means quantum error cor correction can be applied and can be successful. Um, what we've done is that we, we want a lot of them. And then we'll work on the fidelity. So, Back to where we were. Um, the way we do that is by using quantum optics. So basically, um, I want to just give you a quick reminder without insulting anybody. The quantum electromagnetic field is this. It's got the two quadrature operators, uh, analog to position and momentum, uh, historically called amplitude and phase. And uh, they are expressed uh, this way in terms of the annihilation creation operators. 
for photons, that's a photon number operator. We got the commutator and everything. And um, the Heisenberg, of course, inequality between the two and uh, can be drawn in phase space uh, by a circle if you're talking about the vacuum state, for example, or a coherent state has the same circle, except it's not centered on zero. And you also can have squeeze states where the variance, the standard deviation on one operator is here, Q is smaller, and therefore that on P has to increase. And um, then you can uh, look at interesting, this is a single mode squeeze state, now we have two mode squeeze states. And um, particular, um, the sort of idealized version is the EPR state from Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. And they are eigenstates of both for two modes. So it's going to be two fields, right? And all these fields are going to be defined by cavity modes. So we're going to have optical parametric and optical parametric oscillators, and all the modes of the oscillator um, are going to be our different fields. And so uh, an EPR, the EPR state is just this. Um, so it's a continuous variable state because it's an eigenstate of the field. Think also position. Uh, in the EPR paper, that's what they used. They used um, wave functions, which were delta functions, which are as unphysical and uh, unnormalized as this infinite integral here, which is the uh, direct notation of it. And so this state has, for any Q uh, amplitude of a field, uh, field one has a Q for field two. And this is entangled. It's not separable. You can't factorize that state into a product. Okay. Uh, if you Fourier transform that to get from the position to the momentum, you still get an, an, uh, um, an entangled state, which is exactly what happens when you have a Bell state in the um, spin along Z uh, basis, and you look at the spin along X eigenbasis, and you also find a Bell state. Um, <coughs> and the Schmidt basis of that is, whoa, is the uh, photon number basis which is very convenient. And so it tells you that if you have n photons in mode one, you should have n photons in mode two. And then that suggests that really, if you have a two photon non-degenerate two photon emitter, you should be able to create a state like that. And with um, parametric down conversion inside a cavity, so an optical parametric amplifier, uh, with a pump photon annihilation, you create a photon pair at the resonance frequencies of a cavity. And if you pick uh, two particular modes there, you get that particular state, which is the physical uh, approximation of that ideal unphysical state here. And <coughs> it's, it's expressed in the Fox 8 basis in the same way, except that it has coefficients that depends on this parameter R, which is the squeezing parameter, which is also the emission rate of the OPA. Okay, and so if that squeezing goes to infinity, then you get uh, an EPR state. So squeezing going to infinity, equivalent to emission rate going to infinity, equivalent to infinite energy, equivalent to non-physical. Right. So um, this is nice, uh, but we can make it in the lab. This is what we can make in the lab. Now, <clears throat> there's the question of, you know, if I have squeezing infinity here, I'm going to shrink that to zero, and that's going to expand to infinity on the, in the other direction. And then I have a zero error because my uh, squeezing gives me a perfectly defined measurement of Q. If I don't have infinite squeezing, I have a little fuzzy, fuzziness left. Does that kill me? No, it doesn't. Right? There's a fault tolerance threshold that's now expressed. It's a recent result in terms of squeezing. And if you want 10 to minus 6 error rate with continuous variable quantum computing, you just need 20 dB of squeezing, which is a lot, but it's not crazy a lot. Uh, because the record by Roman Schnabel in um, Hamburg is 15 dB uh, in the lab on a single mode. So uh, five more. only five more. And in fact, you can 10 minus 6 error rate is a crazy error rate. 10 minus 4 just requires 18 dB. And if you go uh, topological error correction, it's 1%, and you just need 15.3 dB. And that's not even optimized. So I'll talk more about this, but it's just to give you um, uh, an idea that this is not uh, totally crazy. Um, and <clears throat> how do we want to know, how do we know that uh, this, uh, we have this in the lab where we measure the, what we call, variance-based, what the n 
called variance-based entanglement witnesses or nullifiers, which is the same way as the EPR state. You can see that if you look at uh, Q1 minus Q2, you apply it to this state. Well, you get Q minus Q, you get zero. That's an eigenvalue zero. That's an eigenstate. Here, P1 plus P2 also has eigenvalue zero. That guy is also an eigenstate. So if you measure these operators time after time on that state, you will get zero variance. You will get you know, an eigenstate. So always the same result. Well, this here will give you the same kind of thing, except the variance will be exponential minus 2R, where R is the squeezing. So it goes to zero if R is infinite. It doesn't go exactly to zero. OK, so um, some people have uh, started with Seth Floyd and Sam Brownstein, uh, worked on uh, continuous variable quantum computing. And uh, there's, and others have uh, built upon that, and so the theory is pretty well known. There is, uh, in fact, uh, a very nice analogy between the qubit formalism and the Q-mode continuous variable formalism. The Pauli group, which is generated by the Pauli operator Z and X and all their products, uh, turns into the Weyer-Heisenberg group, which is known already for qubits. Um, which is the Pauli group is weird uh, because it's both unitary. These operators are both unitary and Hermitian. As soon as you go to Qdit, the Pauli group is unitary, and the operators are not Hermitian anymore. They're exponentials of spins. They're, they're rotation operators. Well, that's the same kind of uh, thing that happens here, except they're not rotations; they're translations in continuous variables. So this is a phase shift, and that's an amplitude shift. Um, <coughs> so these are well known for position and momentum. And the computational basis goes from 0, zero and 1 to the eigenstate of Q, uh, which I call an amplitude eigenstate. And so X, which is the flip operator, is also a shift by in Bay modulo 2. And that's exactly what it is. It's a translation operator that shifts um, the um, amplitude. And this guy is just uh, flips the sign for 1, not for 0. You could see that as a pi phase shift, e to the i pi times the value of that thing, if j, right? Well, it's exactly like a phase shift for continuous variable, except now you have a continuous parameter for the uh, Q mode and a continuous uh, parameter for the phase shift variable. So everything goes continuous, but you, you have a complete analogy. And uh, you can uh, look at the plus minus basis, that is 0 plus or minus 1, turns into the P basis, the Fourier basis. So the Hadamard that connects the two is the Fourier transform here. And so then you can keep going. The Clifford group that leaves the Pauli group invariant, which is the one that characterizes everything that's easy to do in quantum computing. And therefore, if you want to do something that's exponentially faster in quantum computing, you have to have one non-Clifford gate somewhere. Well, that translates to the normalizer of the Weyer-Hasma group, which is the, the group of all Gaussian operations. Um, and that includes, at most, quadratic Hamiltonians. And this includes all phase shifts, beam splitters, squeezers, and control gates of the type control, uh, control shifts in amplitude of phase, and homodyne detection uh, also. So all that stuff is, is, uh, can be completely translated. Um, and and um, then you can go to cluster states, and all, those also have complete uh, connections. So you have the cluster state that I showed you here. <coughs> which is two plus states con uh, with a control Z. Well, you can write them as two. The plus state was a f um, infinite, uh, phase eigenstate, so with eigenvalue 0, connected by uh, the equivalent of a control phase, which is uh, this, this gate here, which is a control phase shift, controlled by Q1. Um, and so you can, uh, I will, s the stabilizers, the cluster graphs have stabilizers, operators that leave the cluster invariant. And that if you measure those operators, you can tell that you have a cluster state. Um, I spare you all the definitions. But the way we're doing it in the lab with a two-mode squeezer, uh, whose Hamiltonian is here, and you connect those two with two vacuum states with this Hamiltonian, well, that's a different graph. It has nothing to do with that. But as it turns out, um, the adjacency matrix of that graph and of this graph can be made exactly the same. So in fact, this uh, recipe for what we're doing in the lab is under certain conditions that are well, well known, uh, an acceptable recipe for creating exactly that state. So this is what we're doing, what we're doing, and the details have been worked out by Nick Menicucci, Steve Flamia, and Peter Van Loek. 
um, and I've been fortunate to work with those guys. And so this is uh, where we came up about this. Um, and, and this is a slide that I love because uh, the Department of Defense Program Managers in the United States don't understand the existence of that creature there. Uh, they don't understand uh, what it's good for and what it's doing. I mean, that, that guy doesn't even know what he's doing because he, he's barely seen this. Right? But we can see that he's, he has a m more promising future than the goal-oriented person. It's not always true that it's like that, but you know, that's a slide that I got from Ted Hench, so I think uh, I'm adopting it. So speaking of, uh, this is why we're doing all this. If you take a single cavity, that's a lot of modes. If you put a gain medium, a linear gain medium, and you make that thing, it's a laser, you make it laze, it's going to emit photon by photon in the resonantly uh, defined constructive interference modes there. Right. Now, this is interesting because it can have millions of modes. Right. And the lasers that emit uh, with uh, carrier envelope phase locked operation, mode locked lasers, uh, are very useful as optical frequency combs, and these are uh, the ones that Jan Hall and Ted Hench got the Nobel Prize for with Rory Glauber. Um, <clears throat> and the idea is that, well, we take this, and instead of having a laser, we take a nonlinear gain medium here, which is this kind of guy, parametric down converting crystal, and instead of emitting the photons one by one, we emit photons in pairs. And so, since the pair emission is the mechanism to create EPR states, now we look at this. If this field is getting entangled with that field in terms of EPR entanglement, and then that field is getting entangled with that other field in terms of EPR entanglement, and then this one entangled to that other one in terms of EPR entanglement, what does that give me in terms of all the fields taken together? Well, it's not an easy question to answer. Uh, it's impossible to express multipartite entanglement in terms of bipartite entanglement. In fact, in, G, in the case of GSE entanglement, there's no bipartite entanglement inside the GSE state. But if you work all the uh, Heisenberg equation of motions for this, you can find that, yes, there is a possibility to use that mechanism and land a big, pardon my French, a big-ass entangled state with, with uh, the right properties, i.e. a cluster state in particular. So I'm going to tell you in detail how that works. So this is the first paper we wrote. With, this is Nick Manicucci and Steve Flamia. Those two guys uh, were dis disciples of Carl Caves at the University of New Mexico. So Nick was an undergrad there, uh, published a paper in PRL with Carl, and then went to Princeton for grad school to do string theory, got bored after two years, shipped to University of Queensland to work with Michael Nielsen, and um, that's when I, I met him in 2006. Um, and then Steve Flamia was a graduate student with Carl Caves. And those two guys uh, decided they were interested in the crazy ideas I had. So that was my uh, a really fortunate turn of events. And so we started discussing together. And uh, we came up with a, a model. This is a quantum state that could be emitted by an OPO. Um, and you can see this is a square grid, really, rolled into a tube and wrapped around into a torus. But uh, it's really what's important is a square grid. There's lots of different. So each black point here is a Q mode. So it's a mode uh, of a cavity of an OPO with a given frequency and a given polarization. And so uh, these are all connected by nonlinear interactions. Believe it or not, if I tell you it's feasible in a single OPO. It needs a crystal that does three different nonlinear interactions at the same time. Uh, with periodically pulled crystals, quasi phase match crystal, it's doable. I have those in my lab. I have tested them. They work exactly as planned. And um, you need a pump that's slightly more complicated, uh, a pump field that has all these frequencies. If you look at this pattern, it doesn't look, it looks almost symmetric, but it's not. It's really not. And the red and blue lines correspond to orthogonal polarization. So that, that thing is hell. Uh, so we went for a different uh, method, but that, in theory, that would work and make that state. But that OPO is, it's a single OPO, but the pump is uh, still a little bit complicated. So, so yeah, so and it's 15, what, however, many, uh, however many modes you want to make. It doesn't change, it never changes. So there's something universal about 15 that we haven't figured out. So what we started with baby steps, um, this is the optical frequency comb, the spectrum of an OPO cavity. 
and this is all just the different frequencies. And for each frequency, I have two lines for two orthogonal polarizations. So we're going to work with polarization degenerate cavities that have two orthogonal polarizations at each frequency. What we did in the lab is that we turned uh, this, we entangled this into a bunch of square cluster states, so, or ring, ring cluster states. They are cluster states, we checked. And there's uh, 15 of them times, times four, there's 60 modes. Uh, so that was our first experiment uh, in 2011. Um, yeah. Why are they connected? Why do they Yeah. So they're, they're connected by a nonlinear interaction. So, so the, the idea is that a given frequency and a given polarization defines a given Q mode. Right? If you flip the polarization 90 degrees, it's another Hilbert space, it's an independent Q mode. And then the interaction connects the different frequencies and the different polarizations. Uh, just for experimental convenience. I'm going to show you uh, in detail the, uh, the next step, which is this. So with the same 60 modes, we made one uh, long cluster state chain, or actually with a minor modification. Uh, actually, we can do that on the fly in the experiment. We can turn that guy into two independent uh, uh, chains. And this is only what we could measure. Uh, we think it's actually much bigger than that. Um, so this is based on an idea that Nick Minikuchi got uh, in the time domain and we've uh, transposed in the frequency domain. So the idea is like that. You have here a squeeze state uh, that's the same as what I showed before. It was like uh, amplitude squeeze. And here you have a phase squeeze state or an amplitude squeeze that's rotated by pi over 2, phase shifted by pi over 2. And then they're mixed. If you mix them at a 50-50 beam splitter here, what you get is a two-mode squeeze state, which is exactly the two-mode squeeze state that I showed you that's emitted by a, a two-mode squeezer. Right? So you can do that it's well known, either by, by two single-mode squeezers that you interfere in quadrature, or by one two-mode squeezer uh, directly, you get the same state. And then the idea is that you have a delay line here. This is just a pool of optical, spool of optical fiber, such that the EPR pairs that you can you can see this as a CW output, and you can just say, well, that OPO that emits those squeeze state, they have a cavity lifetime. And if you wait longer than the cavity lifetime, you can define a different time beams that are uh, uncorrelated. They're completely different. So you, have, you can look at the output of this as a bunch of EPR pairs. And this guy got behind because it's delayed here. So by the time they hit the second beam splitter, the second beam splitter, if, if it was the EPR pair here and there was no delay, it would go hit that second beam splitter and disentangle and make, again, the two squeeze states. Right? But that's not what happens because there's a delay line here, and so that guy gets behind. And when he hits the beam splitter, there's the guy from the pair behind. So the beam splitter couples those guys between across different pairs. And the result of that, you need to do a little bit of calculations uh, to do that, is that multi-partite entangled state, that long chain, the dual rail quantum wire, that we call it. And um, um, you can measure this by, a, by a balance homodyne detection on each side, and the quantum noise will inform you on the correlations that must exist and that are actually uh, depicted by these edges here. And so uh, there is a very uh, rigorously defined um, um, pattern of correlations, of quantum correlations that you must have uh, that's reflected by the, the, the lines in these graphs that are just the, the control phase gates. And so Akira Furusawa did that. Uh, they, they just they took the blueprint and they built it in their labs. And they got 10,000 Q modes, two at a time. And every time they measure them, the next one are correlated with the measurement of the previous one. And they keep doing that. And this is correlated in a cluster state uh, for 10,000 modes. Yes? I'm sorry, could you explain what the different colors are? What's a white circle and what is a yellow so, so the, the circles is just because the, the ones that get together. So this is, time, this is the, time, uh, the time arrow here. How is that different from a black? Uh, this is the same. It's the same. It's just, just to, to visualize them. The, the, the blue and yellow are different. These are, these are uh, edges that have opposite signs in the graph. And 
that doesn't work for qubit cluster states. Uh, you have to have all the edges the same weight, but for Q-mode cluster states, you can have weighted graphs, and that still works. Uh, in technical terms, weighted graphs are still stabilizer states for Q-modes. They are not stabilizer states for qubit. There's a difference. So, so um, that can give you uh, more details. So Akira, uh, Akira's group just worked a little bit harder and went to a million mode uh, very recently. Yes? So yeah, so the time domain, it's a very good question. The time domain is the labeling of your Q modes, but the, uh, the variable, the quantum variable that is used in the entanglement is the quantum uh, amplitude of a field, the quadrature, so Q, the Q eigenvalue of the uh, field operator, uh, amplitude quadrature, analog to position of a harmonic oscillator. So if you can, this is all harmonic oscillator, so if you, right, the position momentum amplitude phase. Right, so it's entangled in Q and P and photon number. That, that's where it's entangled in. Across different, across different, so here, across different, these are exactly the same frequencies, different times. What I'm gonna show you in the next slide is our work with different frequencies. So, um, so Akira went uh, one million modes, it's two at a time because they are every 150 nanoseconds, there's two more, so they're 45 meters apart, so. Um, but that works, you can, you can do quantum computing like that by building a cluster state and measuring it as you go. It's called the Wallace and Gromit uh, model because there's this claymation cartoon where there's a runaway tra train, toy train, and uh, Wallace and Gromit are aboard the train and somehow the dog Gromit, who's really clever, uh, grabs a box of rails and builds a track before the train because it's supposed to make it better, it's funny. Um, but that's, you can run quantum computing in a cluster state uh, one-way one model like that. Okay, so uh, this is how we do it in the frequency domain. So we have the, it's a single OPO, okay? It's a single OPO. These are the resonant modes of the OPO, but we'll have an OPO that has two nonlinear optical crystals identical rotated by 90 degrees. That way the optical path is the same for each orthogonal polarization. Therefore they have, this, they have resonant frequencies at the same lengths, right? Now, when we do that, we're gonna send two pumps. So this is now the frequency axis, not the time axis. We have two pumps. I have one pump whose half frequency is here. Uh, and in one crystal, it's Y polarized, it's gonna make Y polarized pairs, uh, all these uh, orange lines. The other pump, half the frequency is one free spectral range away exactly, and it's gonna make EPR pairs that way with all these arrows. And so now if you see that, if I start from zero, that frequency zero, uh, on the Z, I'm, I'm getting entangled with frequency one. If I jump on the frequency Y, which has nothing to do with Z for now, so there's no correlations there, but there will be soon, then one is entangled with minus two. If I jump back on Y, minus two is entangled with three. And you see that the pattern is that I'm spiraling along a chain, right? So that, that gets all the modes. So if I reorder those frequencies, now I'm getting those EPR pairs separated out cleanly and they're staggered pretty much like the other time domain pairs. It's the same idea. And now what do I do? Well, these are the same frequency. Uh, it's a minus one frequency that was here. These are the two polarization, the Z and the Y polarization. What I do is I just send them, they're all coming out of the OPO in the same beam, TM00 mode, the same beam, lots of different frequencies and polarizations. I send that into a beam splitter, which is just gonna be half wave plate, 45 degree rotation, polarizing beam splitter. Boom, that's a 50-50 beam splitter on each, in each of these guys. And by Nick Minikuchi's work, we get, we're supposed to get that state. Okay, so we set out to do this. And the way you measure that state is that you're gonna measure, uh, for qubits, you're gonna measure X on that guy and Z on all the neighbors. So for Q modes, these are X and Z are now translation operators, they're unitary operation, operators but it's e to the i p and e to the i q. So you're gonna measure, instead of a product of x times z, 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 and z, you're gonna measure the sum of p, well, linear combination of p minus q, minus q, minus q, minus q here. And that's uh, something we can do. Um, so these are the operators, in fact, we can do for each link of a chain. We have four fields, in fact, we can re rewrite this as linear combinations of a what we call the nullifiers or the stabilizers. I can give you more details if you want. 
Um, and link by link, we're going to measure those four, those four operators and find they should be squeezed. If they're squeezed, then we know we have that kind of configuration for the graph. And then we move on to the next link, and so on and so forth. This is what the experiment looks like. Uh, there's three lasers. These are YAG lasers at 1064 nanometers. Their frequency doubled here and here. Those two guys are phase locked together at a two free spectral ranges apart, right? So that the high frequencies are one free spectral range apart. Um, then this is the OPO. It's got two crystals. Y, 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 Z, Z, Z. It's the same crystals, quasi phase match, uh, periodically pulled a 9 micron uh, KTP. <coughs> this one is rotated 90 degrees. Uh, there's a third laser that's phase locked to one of these guys here. Uh, at any kind of frequency, we can move the frequency around. This, it's some two, a couple sidebands are put there, and there's a filter cavity, and we're sending here the OPO output is coming here. This is the entangling half wave plate and the beam splitter here. We have homodyne detection here for one polarization, homodyne detection there for another polarization, and each homodyne detection has two frequencies. Now we're measuring two frequencies and two polarizations, that's four modes, and with an RF network here, of, we can do linear combinations of those four modes to coincide with the operators, the four mode operators that should be squeezed and should give us the, um, the graph state that we want. Um, th there's a couple more uh, pound driver holes, so the OPO cavity is locked on the, uh, the seed uh, laser beam, uh, injection uh, locking beam. The filter cavity is also pound driver hole locked. Uh, and uh, that's it for now. There's, we, we're adding, uh, and then there's a little uh, phase uh, shift for the local oscillator to get uh, our squeezing uh, quadrature scan. And this is what the OPO looks like. There's two uh, crystals here that are in little ovens uh, controlled at a tenth of a milli degree uh, by our own servo loop, uh, homemade. Run that in Gila with Jan Hall. Uh, this is the piezo. There's a, the four mirrors here of the bow tie cavity, so that's a very stable OPO. And uh, this is what happens when we measure. So here is the frequency comb. Uh, we have our two pumps here, and this is where we put the local oscillator frequencies, here and there. Now, if I look at the entangled graphs that I got from the beam speeder, as I showed you, these are two neighboring. Uh, nodes of a link, so they have all these edges between them, so they should be entangled. And uh, when you measure the squeezing, which is a four-mode squeezing between those four modes, you see squeezing here. Uh, then you move on to the next link, and you see squeezing there. And if you do the wrong thing, say I'm putting my frequencies here, and if I look at the graph, it means I'm looking at the uh, correlations in the graph between those two uh, pairs of nodes, and there's no direct edge in the graph between those nodes. Therefore, there should not be quantum correlations, and there aren't. Right? And if you measure the squeezing there, you get uh, excess noise that's phase independent, and um, that's exactly what the, also the level of a the theoretical prediction. And I, I call it quantum radio. You know, if you don't tune to the right quantum station, you get static. Uh, and that's the, that's the thing. So you keep doing that, so you start like that, and then you move your local oscillator, you get squeezing, you move your local oscillator. So these are the first results that my student uh, Moran got. So sometimes the scans are not completely synchronized, but every time it's squeezed, it's squeezed, and you keep going, and you keep going, and you keep going. There's a piezo turning point sometimes because these are raw data. And you go all the way, now you do the, these are the blue, now you do the red, you know, and then you get everything, and it's long, and you measure a few ones that are wrong to make sure they're still wrong. And then you get the data for the whole mo for the whole ho the whole comb, and uh, tells you that you actually got the number of dB is three minus 3.2, uh, which, which breaks a threshold of non-separability for mixtures as well. So we are absolutely sure that this is completely entangled this way. Um, and then you can make two wires, uh, and that works too. So, and just to tell you an idea of how. How many modes do we think we have? Well, what we did is instead of down converting the pump into the single idler, we up converted by some frequency generation by taking two tunable diode lasers instead of YAG lasers, and we moved them like that so that they always give the same sum frequency. And when we get 
um, there's a little bit of peak, there's a second harmonic generation signal, but the sum frequency generation signal is there. It's flat over 3.2 terahertz. The modes are spaced by one gigahertz. So that's 3.2 thousand, 3,000 3, modes times two for the polarization. That's, that's about uh, how many modes we think we have. That's um, from a classical nonlinear optical characterization of the OPO crystal, not from the quantum. Uh, because our local oscillator, we didn't have the diode laser for the local oscillator. We had just the electro-optic modulator. So I'm going to, uh, well, we, we want to do this uh, with time domain, time delay, and frequency entanglement. We think we can make this. Uh, we haven't made it, but if you stare at this long enough, it will look eerily familiar. So that would be a square grid lattice. Um, this is the uh, fault tolerance threshold result by Nick Menicucci. Uh, where the different error thresholds are there and the squeezing as required is there. And you see that 10 minus 6 corresponds to 20. But, you know, if you have a better way of doing quantum error corrections, such as a topological encoding, uh, then you get much less squeezing required. And that's not even optimized. That's just an existence proof of, uh, of, of the fault tolerance threshold. We're working on getting a lot of squeezing, a lot more than we've ever got in my lab. And uh, these are the conclusions, and where we want to go next is quantum simulation, because there's lots of interesting things where you can map boson entanglement to spin entanglement. We've started working on that, but it's, it's a very uh, difficult thing for us, because really all these things uh, are condensed matter uh, topics, so we work. It's good that we have Israel Klish in our department, who's a genius, as far as I'm concerned, not, not just playing the guitar. I play the guitar too, and he plays the guitar better than me also. So, and uh, Raphael Alexander, who is our postdoc, uh, and is uh, Nick Minikuchi's first student. And so we're also uh, thinking about topological entanglement entropy, which is doable in uh, continuous variable quantum entanglement. So there's a lot of rich um, uh, possibilities here. And uh, these are the heroes. Moran is the person who did all the experiments by yourself, because I'm just giving advice. This is Nick. Um, <clears throat> these are the new guys. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>